better calm down, son. White won't get you anywhere. Yeah, well, you can't arrest me. I don't know anything about that. Oh, I'll save your breath. You'll have a chance to explain that before. Extra all about the world's money. They get an extra payment just now. All hey, about give me that big ranch. Extra uh, all about the world's money. Hey, give extra. me what? Yes, sir, mister. They just got the guy. They caught him. All about the world's money. Extra payment. Yes, sir. You can and read it to me payment. while I'm working. Okay. That guy looks like he's seen everything anyhow. Well, the old guy's troubles are over now. She's swell looking Dane. Much younger than the old boy. Say, that guy ain't no murderer. How do you know? Well, look at the face. Intelligent forehead and a swell pair of eyes. You can't tell by the face and eyes. Why, only last week they're telling me about it. Prosecution may state its case. Your Honor, and gentlemen of the jury, when a crime is committed against any single individual of our state, it is committed against every individual of our state and against the state itself. We have come here to this court of justice to prove that the defendant, David Wells, has committed a crime. That Deliberately and willfully, he did murder upon the body of one Emery Wells. Murder, under any circumstance, is the most heinous of crimes. But, gentlemen of the jury, when a man, with malice aforethought, wantonly commits such a crime upon his own flesh and blood, upon one whom he should respect and honor, and revere, I cannot find a word strong enough to describe such a deed. Gentlemen, the state is going to prove that David Wells planned to kill and then did kill his own father. The state is going further than that. It is going to prove that this crime, without a single extenuating circumstance, was committed solely for a mercenary purpose. I am not now going to outline the state's case for the reason it's so obvious, so simple, and so completely convincing that I want you, gentlemen of the jury, to hear it as I first heard it from the testimony of the witness. I do not have to give you a picture of the events that led up to and immediately followed the crime. 
I do not have to explain motive and act because the testimony that you shall hear will make them so evident that you will be convinced as the state is that the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree. Call the first witness. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the evidence you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. What's your name? Martha Gregory. You must sit down. Miss Gregory, what's your occupation? I was Emery Wells' housekeeper. Were you in the home of Emery Wells on uh, October 2nd last? Yes, sir. You tell us in your own words, Mrs. Gregory, just what took place on the evening of October 2nd. Nothing very unusual happened until about 15 minutes after 9. Uh, I was at the linen closet, uh, not far from the door to Mr. Wells' study. What is the matter, Mrs. Gregory? Mr. Wells, dead! What's that? Mr. Wells, in there! What's all the screaming about? What's oh, the matter? Hush, darling. Something serious. Why, what's the matter? Bart, phone the police. Warren, what's happened? Is it Emery? Yes. You might as well know the truth, I know. It's murder. Etta, get some smelling salts in the morning, quickly. Well, right after that, the police arrived and took charge. That's all, Miss Lady. Mrs. Gregory. Why did you delay after you thought you heard revolver shots? Why did you delay going into the study? I was afraid. Afraid of what? I was afraid that, that, that something might have happened to Mr. Wells. You testified that you first went to the servants' quarters. And there found Etta Billings, the maid, lying on her bed reading a magazine. Did you not? Yes. That's all. Raymond Bart, take the stand, please.
Raise your right hand. I solemnly swear the evidence about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help to God. I do. What's your name? Bob, sir. Raymond Bob. Sit down. Raymond Bob, what's your position in the home of Emory Wells? I am the butler, sir. Now, tell us what happened there on the afternoon and evening of October 2nd. Early in the afternoon, I answered the telephone. It was Mr. Wells' son, David. It was the first time Mr. David had called in many months. Well, yes, well, if you must, nine o'clock. My son will be here this evening at nine o'clock. Call him in when he arrives. Very well, sir. How do you do, Mr. David? Hello, Bart. My father's expecting you. Yes, sir. Come in. Mr. Wells, yes. What's that? Mr. Wells, in there. And then Mr. Slade went into the room and found that Mr. Wells was dead. That's all, Mr. Boggs. Thank you. When Mrs. Gregory's cry summoned you, just where did your path lead you? Into the lower hallway, sir. The living room is on one side of the hall, and the library on the other, is it not? Yes, sir. Now tell the jury just what you saw in the hall. Mr. Slade was crossing the hall from the foot of the stairs. Mrs. Wells didn't come down until later. Mr. Slade then was downstairs, and... Mrs. Wells was coming down, is that it? Why, yes, sir. That's correct. I see. That's all. Mr. Warren Slade will take the stand, please. You're through. swear the testimony about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you God. I do. What's your name? Warren Slade. What was your duty in connection with Emory Wells? I was Mr. Wells' attorney. Were you at the Emory uh, Wells' home on the evening of October 2nd? I was. 
I arrived there about 8.30. The Wells had sent for me. Had he said why he sent for you? Yes. He wanted to discuss drawing up a new will. Well, tell us just uh, what happened then. Well, when I arrived there, the Wells was waiting for me in his study. Glad you've come. David will be here in a short time. I want him to witness my new will. <clears throat> what, you didn't ask me to draw a new will, Mr. Wells? I wrote it myself. I knew what I wanted. Well, uh, does the new will establish a trust fund of $100,000 for David? I'm canceling that. He gets $1, and that's all he will ever get. And another thing, I've changed most of the terms of my old will, and my servants won't get one penny of my money. Well, do you realize what you're doing? I know perfectly well what I'm doing. I've canceled all the bequests of the old will, and it will. Come in. Good evening, David. Good evening. Well, I'll leave you two gentlemen. Just wait for me, Slade. There's something else I want to see you about. All right, Mr. Well. When I next went into the study, Mr. Wells was his desk. Had Mr. Wells signed the new will? Not that I know of. At least, never to be found. As there is no uh, evidence that the new will had been signed, the previous one will still stand. Is that right? Correct. Right. Yes. And the trust fund of $100,000 for David Wells remains? Uh, that's all. Mr. Slay, you were alone in the hall, were you not, when you heard Mrs. Gregory call for help? Yes, yes, I was. But tell me, have you any idea what that other matter was that Mr. Wells wanted to discuss with you? No, I haven't. That's all. And it's well sit down, please. Order in the court, please. Raise your right hand, please. Yes, hand on the book. You solemnly swear the testimony you're giving in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. And what is your name? Mrs. Imus Wells. Sit down, please. And Mrs. Wells, do you recognize these? Yes. They're a portion of the Wells collection of diamonds. Oh. Only a portion. Yes, that's just about half of them. Do you know where the rest are? No. They disappeared the night of my husband's death. I, uh, I offer these as evidence. Uh, Mrs. Wells. How long since David Wells resided at your husband's house? About three months. Why did he leave? David and his father quarreled. Oh. Oh, they quarreled. Uh, what did they quarrel about? 
I don't know. David and his father were always close companions. It must have been something of a very serious nature. Object, Your Honor. The witness is giving opinions, not facts. Objection sustained. Strike out the last question and answer. Uh, that's all, Ms. Wells. Thank you. Mrs. Wells, uh, where were you when the defendant entered your home on the evening of October the 2nd? In my room, preparing to retire. Uh, what time was it? About 9 o'clock. Do you generally prepare to retire as early as 9 o'clock? No. Yes, I had a headache that night. Did you remain in your room until you heard Mrs. Gregory's cries for help? Yes, I did. Now, uh, were you alone in your room from the moment you entered it until you heard those cries? Were you, Mrs. Wells? No. Oh. Then someone came into your room. Mr. Slade came upstairs after he left Mr. Wells. Uh, Mrs. Wells, why did you receive your husband's attorney in your room when you were preparing to retire? I, I wanted to ask his advice about some stock I intended to purchase. How long did Mr. Well, Mr. Slade remain in your room? Until we heard the noise from downstairs. What did the noise sound like? It uh, might have been revolver shot? Yes, as though something heavy might have fallen, or a report, or... Yes, like a revolver shot. I see. Now tell me, your, uh, your room is on the same side of the house, and directly over the study, is it not? Yes. Did you see anyone cross the grounds after the noises you heard? I couldn't see. No. Ah. Perhaps the uh, blinds were drawn over your windows. Yes, they were. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is well. What was the stock you discussed with Mr. Slade? I... I don't remember. You don't remember? No. It was so vital that you discussed this matter of the stocks with Mr. Slade, that you invited him to your room. And now you tell me you don't even remember the name of the stocks. Mrs. Wells, have you ever purchased any stock? No. <laughs> Order in the court, please. That's all. This court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Raise your right hand. Put your left hand on the book. You solemnly swear the evidence you give me in the case be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help your God. I do. And what's your name? Etta Billings. Sit down. Miss Billings, on October the 2nd, what was your occupation? I was downstairs maid in Mr. Wells' home. Tell the jury what you heard and saw on that evening. I finished my work about 9 and thought I'd go out for a breath of fresh air. I knew you would come to me begging. I'm not begging. I'm only asking for what's rightfully mine. You can't make me change my mind. Even though you're my father, I'll say that a man like you hasn't the right to live. Miss Billings, are you still working in the Wells household? No. Now why did you leave? Mrs. Wells discharged me. When? The day after Mr. Wells died. Tell me, uh, how did you first obtain your position there? 
Mr. Gregory got me the job. Mrs. Gregory takes a great interest in it, doesn't she? Uh, yes, she does. Is Mrs. Gregory any relation to you? I object, Your Honor. This line of questioning has no bearing on the case. What does counsel desire to prove by this line of questioning? Your Honor, there will be reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt if it can be proved that there were others who had motive and opportunity to commit the crime, especially as no direct evidence has been submitted regarding the actual moment at which the defendant left his father's study. Objection overruled. Counsel may proceed. I'll ask the question again. Is Mrs. Gregory any relation to you? Yes. What? She's my mother. In her testimony, your mother spoke of being afraid. Was she afraid on your account? No. Had you any reason for hating Mr. Wells? Why should I? I'm asking the questions. Had you any reason for hating Mr. Wells? No. Did you have any reason to kill him? I object. The witness is not on trial. Objection sustained. You need not answer that question. That's all. I solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. What's your name? John Shannon Morris. Officer Miles, where did you do duty on uh, October 2nd, last, in Forest Hill? Mm. Did anything unusual happen near 57 Saban Drive that night? Yes, it did. About 9.20 that night, I was reporting to the station house. Maybe you don't know it's nighttime, young fella. Where are your parking lights? recognize the young lady who was in that car if you saw her again? Yes, I would. You see her anywhere in this courtroom? That's her. That's all. No questions. Lieutenant Elkins, you're on the homicide squad, are you not? Yes. Did you arrest David Wells? I did. Hmm. Explain the circumstance under which the arrest was made. Well, the night that Embry Wells was killed, we couldn't find any trace of young Wells. But the next morning, I was making the rounds of the railroad station and picked him up. Are you 
David Wales? Oh, yes. They want you down to headquarters. That can't be. But it is. Making a getaway, eh? A meet in Nevada. That'll be a great place to hide out. Two tickets. Taking a lady? I don't know what you're talking about. Come along, the chief will tell you all about it. Listen, you can't I think I don't know. want to. Captain Elkin. The defense is perfectly willing to concede that Emory Wells met his death by a 32 caliber bullet. But have you found the gun from which that bullet was fired? No. Now, the mere fact of discovering a bullet would have no bearing on who fired the shot, would it? No. That's all. I'm ordered to appear here, officer. They handed me a subpoena. They want to hear my story. Take off your hat. There he is. Your Honor, this gentleman is a material witness, Mr. Ralph Barney. I'd like to have him testify. Ralph Barney, dismiss the stand, please. See? What did I tell you? You solemnly swear the testimony you've given this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you wrong. Yes. What's your name? Ralph Barney. Sit down. Uh, Mr. Barney, are you a married man? Certainly. Living with your wife? I was until lately. Until when? Exactly. October 2nd. She didn't come home that night. I waited up until about 2 o'clock, and then there wasn't any more music on the radio to keep me awake, so I locked the door and slopped. Mm. Your wife didn't come home all night. Is that right? She ain't been home yet. Say, do you know anything a guy can do to make his wife behave? <laughs> Order in the court! I shall not warn the spectators again. I'll have the courtroom cleared. Uh, do you know where your wife was on the night of October 2nd? Yes. It was David Wells. That's all. Uh, Mr. Barney, uh, just what is your occupation? What? I, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, just what do you work at? Oh. Well, I'm right between jobs at the minute. I see. And uh, when you uh, when you do a job, just uh, what sort of a job uh, do you do? Oh, I sell. Uh, say, uh, you ain't going to use this against me, are you? No, 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 no. You uh, you may answer the question. Well, I sell the real McCoy. I'm sorry, I haven't got a bit right now. They've been knocking all the boats over lately. Oh, that's too bad. You uh, you mean you're a bootlegger? Well, I, I guess that's just what you call it. But uh, I got something good coming up, and I think I'm going to land it. Revenue officer. Splendid. Oh, you are Mrs. Bond. Yes. Do you uh, work, Mrs. Bond? I haven't since I've been married. Do you make a practice of staying out all night? I believe my husband answered that. On the night of October 2nd, you were in a car with a defendant near the Wells home. When you left there, where did you go? I can't say. You mean you refused? I mean I can't. On October the 3rd, the defendant bought Two railroad tickets for Nevada. Was one of them intended for you? Yes, I believe it was. And the second one was to be used by the defendant. I can't say. You mean that you're ashamed to say? I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. Not even of associating with a murderer? Object! Counselor not giving a verdict in this case. 
I hope I shan't have to warn the prosecutor again to conduct this trial in a manner becoming to his profession. I apologize to the court and withdraw the question. That's all. Gentlemen, the defense is ready to let the case rest on the evidence of one single witness, the only witness who knows the real truth. David Wells will take the stand. I want you to tell, in your own way, exactly what happened on the evening of October the 2nd. Early that afternoon, I called my father on the telephone. I, I needed a large amount of money. I explained that to him, and we made an appointment for, for that evening. It isn't easy for me to tell you why I needed the money, but because of, of what's happened here, I, I will. I arrived at the house of about nine o'clock. How are you, Mr. David? Hello, Bog. My father's expecting me. Yes, sir. Come in. Good evening, Mr. Good evening, David. Well, I'll leave you, gentlemen. Wait for me, Slade. Something else I want to talk to you about. All right, Mr. Well. I haven't come to ask you for anything except what's rightfully mine. You haven't anything in this house. I beg your pardon, sir. You have the diamonds that were left for my aunt. Half of them were willed to me. What are you going to do with them? For the first time in my life, I need the money that they'll bring. And I need it badly. That doesn't tell me anything. You want it for a woman, I suppose. Yes. She's married. Hmm. Oh, all of us make mistakes. And her marriage was one of her mistakes. She can get a divorce only on one condition. She has to buy it. Ah. Oh, I'm not ashamed of a decent love. And that's what it is. I want her to be free. I want to buy her freedom. So that we might be married. One of those so long as I live. But but you don't understand what they mean to me. I've been waiting for this. I knew you would come to me begging. But I'm not begging. You can't hold back what's really mine. And you can't make me change my mind. Even though you're my father, I'll say a man like you hasn't any right to live. 
Here is something that will interest you. I have made a new will. Look, your inheritance is to be one dollar. And my dear servants, for their loyalty to me, are all to receive nothing. And my dear wife, see, she too is disinherited. And if any of them contest this will, they shall have to contest the reason for the, their disinheritance. Come on. Witness the signature to this. You expect me to sign that? Oh, you refuse. Well, well. You want the diamond. Now, I might make a bargain with you. I don't have to, but I might. I'm not witnessing any signature. Sit down and put your name there, and you shall have your share of the diamond. There must be one other signature to this. One other signature. Could, could I have my share now? Grace is waiting for me outside. I told you you shouldn't touch one of these so long as I live. Do you mean to say you're not going to give them to me after you promised? You will not touch one of them so long as I live. I said you didn't have any right to live. David, did he agree? No. And it's even worse than that. And, and that's the whole truth. I swear it. No witness, Mr. Simpson. You left your father's home three months ago. What was the reason? I can't tell. When you left the night of your father's death, where did you go? I can't tell. You fear that if the truth were known, other evidence of your guilt might come to light? That isn't true. Or that the missing will or diamonds would be found? No. Or even the revolver with which your father was done to death? No. The day after your father was murdered, you were running away, were you not? No. There was only one way left for Grace to secure her freedom. That's why we were going away to get her divorced. Isn't it true that you were the last person to see him alive? I don't know. But you did say that your father hadn't any right to live. Yes, 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 I did. Then you admit that you killed your father. Why, why no, of course not. But he was dead when, when you last saw him. Yes. Uh, no, no, he, he well, was... Well, which do you mean? Yes or no? My father was alive when I left him. Where did you go after you left your father? I asked you, where did you go when you left your father's house? Didn't you hear me? Where did you go? It might be to your advantage to answer that question, my boy. I refuse to answer. Your Honor, I can answer that question. Order, please. Will you take the stand as a witness, madam? Yes. Your Honor, 
I crave permission to put this woman on the stand for questioning. Brother, you can't question her. I tell you, she doesn't know anything about her. I'll tell her. Good job. Good job. Raise your right hand, please. Your left hand on the Bible. You solemnly swear to the testimony you're giving in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Your name, please. Mary Stephen. Sit down. Mrs. Stevens, do you know the accused? Yes. Have you known him long? Yes. I'm his mother. Then, uh, then you are Mr. Wells's first wife. Every promise to marry me. Continue, Mrs. Stevens. You may tell the jury in your own words just what you wish them to know. When I first met Emily Wells, I was a maid in the home of his aunt. We became infatuated with each other, but the family would have disinherited him if he'd married a servant. There was a great deal of pride in the Wells family. When David was born, he was a wonderful baby. The family threatened to eject me and the baby from their home so that my boy could have his father's name and the good things that money could buy. I signed an agreement to give him up. I was to go away forever. I never saw him again until three months ago. I object, Your Honor, on the grounds that the matter referred to by the witness is incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial. May it please the court. The defendant has never told even me about his mother. It is impossible, therefore, that I can make a direct examination of the witness. Objection overruled. The witness may continue. You may continue, Mrs. Stevens. You were, you were saying? David's birth and the nervous strain from the treatment I'd received were too much for me. I lost my health. Emery never offered to help me. And being ill, I could only do occasional work. Although I was as good as dead to the Wells family, I saw from a distance my boy growing into splendid manhood. One day, he came to me. No one will ever know what that meant. For 20 years, I hungered for his arms to be about me. He took me in his arms and kissed me. Your Honor, I object. This is not testimony. It has no bearing on the case in this court. The witness has stated that she can tell where the accused went after he left his father. Objection overruled. Witness may continue. Take your time, Mrs. Stevens. You were saying that your son came to you three months ago. Uh, how did that happen? David found the agreement that I'd signed. He left his father and came to me. And then what did he do? He rented an apartment and made a home for me. It was then that he met Grace Barney. They both tried to make me happy. David never saw his father again until that night. I knew where he was going and followed him. When he left his father's house, I saw him. But David didn't see me. Emily was alive and well. 
when his son left him. When I arrived home, he and Grace were waiting. And that's why my boy couldn't answer your question. He was afraid I couldn't stand the strain of the trial. <laughs> the other ticket he bought was for me. He planned on my going away with Grace. You can't condemn a man for something he didn't do. David did not commit the crime. I know he didn't. Is there a doctor in court? Get one, please. This court is in recess. Gentlemen of the jury, you have the life of a man in the hollow of your hand, the life of an innocent man. The revelations of this case have been as new, as strange, as overwhelming to me as they must have been to you. This boy, David Wells, was willing to go to his death, his lips sealed, in order to protect that unfortunate woman, his mother, from the glaring, pitiless searchlight of notoriety. Gentlemen of the jury, the state has founded its case on nothing but circumstantial evidence. No one saw David Wells fired the shot which killed his father. No one has discovered the revolver from which that shot was fired. No one has been produced by the state to testify as to any actual motive that would induce David Wells to commit so brutal a deed. Gentlemen, Mrs. Stevens herself swore under oath that she saw David Wells leave his father's study. And when he left his father's study, Mrs. Stevens testified that Emory Wells was alive and well. Gentlemen, there is not one shred of direct evidence against the defendant. Would you take the life of any man on such flimsy, indefinite, unsubstantiated evidence as has been submitted by the state? How then, gentlemen, can you send to his death this boy? Gentlemen, if I had a son, I would pray that he were as sincere, as noble, as generous, and as guiltless as that young man who sits there with unwavering faith that you will send him out, a free man, to the bedside of his mother, who clings to the last thin shreds of life, waiting and praying that you will have said her son is not guilty. My worthy opponent has made a splendid appeal because he has appealed to your hearts. But gentlemen, the law knows no appeal to the heart. It must be an appeal to the reason. It is a question of right or wrong. 
we may sympathize with David Wells, but we cannot absolve him of the crime he has committed. He has broken the law. He has taken the life of his own father. And he must pay the penalty. David Wells went into his father's study and quarreled with him. And in the heat of the argument, after threatening him with death, he did actually kill him. And so I say to you, gentlemen of the jury, there is only one verdict you can bring. You must find the defendant guilty. For only with such a verdict can you keep safe the honor of the citizens of our great state. Gentlemen, it's unanimous. When David left, I went in. I told Emery that I'd make a scandal of everything unless he did what was right. He tried to force me out. Then he reached for a gun threatened me. I grabbed the gun and shot him. I killed David's father. I took the diamond and the wheel. And then I went home. Don't tell David I killed his father. Doctor, will you respect that last request? Certainly. Mm. I just wanted a little happiness with my boy. I'm glad. It turned out this way. The children will be happy with each other. And I'll be happy too. I'll go. Hold me tight, just for a moment. Be a good boy. Take care of Grace. I'm all right. Are you there, David? Yes, Mother. I can't see you. 